Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Education has uh, gone virtual during uh, COVID-19, and I wanted to uh, to reach out to uh, to uh, an institution and a gentleman that uh, I'm aware of, um, International School of Management. It's actually located in Paris, France, and uh, Matthew Andrews is joining us tonight. He's currently the Director of Academic Affairs at the International School of Management uh, that, as I mentioned, is in, is in Paris. They've been virtual um, and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bricks and mortars uh, for a while now. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they've had to obviously uh, pivot and go completely uh, virtual. And I wanted to find out what they're all about. And it's interesting because, you know, lots of schools, secondary schools and universities have gone uh, uh, virtual during COVID. But this is a school that uh, provides master's and doctoral programs. And one would think that master's and doctoral programs would be even more challenging to present uh, virtually. Um, ISM uh, offers these master's and doctors, uh, doctoral programs to working executives around the world. Matthew grew up in the U.S., but has lived in France for the last 20 years. Tough life, I'm sure. We'll maybe chat a little bit about that. And uh, he's published research on knowledge management and organizational learning in technology companies. So, Matthew, tell me a little bit uh, off the top, if you could, about uh, the International School of Management. Where are you located? We have our main center in France, as you, you mentioned, in Paris. Um, we're a non-traditional school, so all our students are full-time working executives, or they're adult learners. So our center in Paris is just kind of a, a relatively small seminar center where we do most of our in-person courses throughout the year when it's not you know, an issue with COVID. Uh, which is to say uh, something we haven't done in quite a while now because of the restrictions. Uh, but normally we run our, our courses in Paris and we also run them in different cities in the world uh, with educational partners in Cape Town, uh, New Delhi, New York, um, and Sao Paulo, to name a few locations. Um, but we, we've always had flexible learning options so that students can choose from online, in-person at different locations and to a significant extent, they kind of put together the study options in ways that, that work for them. Um, and so they can progress kind of at their own rhythm through the programs. And it's master's and doctoral. So it's a MBA and a DBA, a doctor of business administration. Is that correct? Yep. And we also have PhD. So we have an international MBA program DBA, Doctor of Business Administration, and a PhD, um, which is a, a also in international business, business administration. Um, it's the more, you know, academic doctoral degree compared to the DBA, which is more practitioner oriented. Right. And how long does the typical student uh, take courses for? In the doctoral program, they can go up to seven years for the PhD, up to six for the DBA. But um, I would say most people are finishing in maybe around five years. Occasionally people go faster. Uh, the IMBA is more like a two year program. Mm -hmm. And does that time period include the thesis as well? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, uh, how big is your school? How many students per year graduate? Well, we've got about Three, three to 400 students who are enrolled at any given time. Um, we're graduating maybe 40 to 50 per year, it depends. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a flexible program. So people enroll, they progress at their own rhythm. Um, and so our student body of three or 400 people, that doesn't mean they're necessarily all active um, right now. You know, some people are have um, are taking courses, some people are working on their research, some people are taking a break um, because they're too preoccupied by the professional activity and they'll get right. back to it later, so. Yeah. And, uh, and schools have to be uh, accredited. Uh, who accredits, accredits you or provides you accreditation? Well, we have a status within the French Ministry of Education as a higher learning establishment. And then we have uh, programmatic accreditation from the ACDSP, um, which is active internationally. It's headquartered in the US, um, got quite a few Canadian schools. Um, 
We also have a, an institutional accreditation from a European accrediting body called ASEA. So you've got all the appropriate accreditations and your faculty, it's reasonably flexible, is it not? You, uh, you hire faculty on a contract basis at different times? Uh, it's mainly a visiting faculty model. That's, that's correct. Um, we have a group of core faculty, um, about uh, 10 people, I think, who have been teaching regularly over the past three or four years and are involved not only in teaching, but also dissertation advising, um, working on some of our standing committees, uh, so in that way, they participate in institutional governance. Fascinating. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Matthew in a minute. And I'm going to ask him about uh, how we've had to pivot uh, during COVID-19 and, and what uh, the learnings of that were in regards to is virtual a good way to learn or a bad way to learn? Stay with us. They usually... Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Second 860. We're chatting tonight with Matthew Andrews. He is uh, with the International School of uh, Management in Paris, France. He's the Director of Academic Affairs. Uh, the International School of Management is a business school that has master's programs and uh, doctoral programs and PhD programs um, uh, and has three to 400 people that uh, are students on an annual uh, basis and uh, 30 to 40 that graduate. And uh, he's got all the appropriate accreditations and he's had a program um, of both visiting faculty uh, for in-class, in-person learning, as well as a virtual for a long period of time. But Matthew, when uh, all of a sudden you couldn't stop, uh, you had to stop bringing people to Paris and uh, to some of your other uh, associated schools, how'd you adapt? What'd you do? Well, as I said, we, had, we already had an e-learning system that was part of our flexible learning option portfolio, you could say. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't a pivot exactly because we, we had that system there. Uh, it was more a question of emphasis. We had to um, build it up more, increase the course offering, and, and go deeper in our use and our understanding of, of the e-learning tools. Um, you know, as a teacher, I certainly had to kind of up my game when it came to using online tools like, like Zoom, um, exploring things that I hadn't, I wasn't using that much before, like the breakout rooms and the online polls and so on. Um, it's, it's an asynchronous system. Uh, so there's a dimension of it where students access the materials, progress at their own rate, upload their assignments. Uh, but what we really uh, emphasized to a greater extent with COVID was making sure that the, the interactive dimension uh, was there present and, um, and getting better. Uh, so we, we emphasize more uh, interactive online sessions, um, recording them as necessary so that people who, who are not able to attend uh, can watch them later. Uh, and also doing more for the student body in terms of events an online networking event for some of our students, particularly the MBA students. There was a few of them who were based in Paris and or had relocated to Paris for their studies. And so it was really bad timing for them when COVID hit. So we came up with some, you know, other types of, of online interactive events, like watching a movie online together, um, uh, having, you know, the pizza night, things like that. So really fascinating. And can yeah. you create culture? Can you create uh, interaction and, uh, and connections and network online virtually? Is it possible? It is possible. It's never going to really substitute in person. In my view, there's just too much learning and value and being in the same room with someone. There's so much about communication that transpires um, by seeing someone, you know, uh, nonverbal communication. Uh, and especially when we're doing, you know, when we're bringing together people from different countries in a country that perhaps no one has ever really been in before. Uh, the experience is so rich and so complex, you can never 
get that really online, but uh, you can certainly develop, you know, a productive system online, uh, a system which allows students to continue with their studies, to, to validate their, their requirements and to have a meaningful experience uh, to interact with each other and with the, with the instructor. What do you think you're going to do uh, once some of the regulations uh, ease up and uh, in learning, in-person learning is, uh, is allowed again? Are you going to go back to uh, an in-person model? Are you going to have a hybrid model? What do you think the future is? We will certainly continue with our hybrid model. Uh, it's the right model for us um, with people living in different countries. Will we return to in person? Definitely, but it would be you know part of the overall um, portfolio of study options that we offer. But definitely, we will uh, return to in person. It's it's a vital part of what we do. I would have think, thought it really is because some of the uh, interaction one could get from people that uh, are from around the world that come to Paris uh, to interact uh, in a uh, in a course over the course of a couple of days, and then also interact uh, socially. Uh, you know, between uh, classes uh, and uh, in, in some of the, the assignments and cases that you have different groups do, you just can't get that rich uh, interaction virtually, can you? I, I don't think you can't completely get it. You can't completely substitute the in-classroom experience. Um, moreover, the, in, the classroom experience is more than just the classroom. It's taking breaks together. It's having a coffee in the student lounge. It's uh, going out for a drink after class. It's, um, it's all the, that other social stuff, too, which, you know, you can't really get that online. Um, so online. Well, some people a, have said that uh, COVID has taught us that, um, you know, the world is flat. So uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, Tom Friedman, I think, who uh, said uh, the world is flat um, mm -hmm. uh, 10 or 15 years ago and that we could live anywhere and, uh, and work anywhere because of uh, global communications and global travel, et cetera. And then uh, I think it was Richard Florida who, uh, who came uh, and countered uh, his and said the world is spiky uh, and that people get together in Paris, London, New York, uh, Tokyo, et cetera, because the world's not flat, it's spiky and you gotta be close to people. Um, you know, your model historically has been that you've brought people to Paris or to New York or, or to Shanghai, um, and you uh, put them into an intensive uh, course for a couple of days where, you know, over a couple of days, you can't help but get to know people real well. It's almost like a, uh, a boot camp for a couple of days and mm -hmm. uh, an intense learning and uh, lots of assignments. And, uh, and as you say, because people are in a city that they've never been in before with people from around the world, they socialize and get to know each other. So yeah, that's absolutely true. Flat? I would go with the spiky model, Brian. Um, that's definitely uh, more in line with, uh, I would say, the ISM experience or the way the ISM experience is, uh, ideally. Uh, there, there's room for a bit of both. I think it depends on what, what type of class you're doing. I do I've, the most uh, recently taught class that, that I've done, or the, the class that I've taught most recently uh, over the past two years is a writing methodology class. And that's part of getting students kind of on board with academic expectations and doing research. That actually works really well online. Um, and you know, it's a requirement, everyone has to do it. And it, it works really well having people in different time zones, bringing them together online and just sort of helping them get through this process of developing a good paper. But the two or three day, you know, intensive experience of, you know, following course on doing business in South Africa or, um, <clears throat> you know, a risk management course that's taught in, in Manhattan um, or a course that's taught in China on doing business in Asia, that is just something you, you can't capture online adequately. So I'm very very much looking forward to returning to those kinds of experiences. So I've heard, uh, you know, some students have excelled um, in online learning because they uh, aren't held back by the average of the class and they're able to speed ahead and uh, do a lot more studies. And then I've heard other people that just go crazy because they desperately need that uh, interaction slash help. What do you think have uh, been some of the learnings that not only ISM, but other institutions have learned during the last year and a half of, of non-in-class learning? Um, 
Well, I suspect that the challenges are greater for more traditional institutions that have undergraduate students. Um, and I know that also from, from my son who was uh, doing his undergraduate studies just when, when COVID hit. And it's a very tough, um, do, doing it all online, I think is really hard um, for a lot of young people. Um, you know, maybe there's some that thrive in it, but, but uh, you know, just starting college with all online courses, personally, I, I don't think that would be uh, something I would want to do. Uh, uh, I think it'd be really challenging. Most of our students do well in it, but, you know, our students are adult workers who are very, for the most part, very autonomous um, and, uh, that, you know, have, have um, a lot of drive to, to get through their studies. Um, they're, they're, they're quite high level professionals. I have, I have had experience with some that struggle. Um, uh, and, um, uh, I would say that's, that's affected primarily someone say who actually relocated to Paris right before COVID hit and was really expecting and looking forward to an in-person experience. And this, you know, unfortunately discovered that everything was online. I, I've known a couple of people who've really struggled with that. I think they really need um, the interactivity um, as, you know, it's, it's, you can coach people, you can give them moral support and so on in ways uh, that, that online just doesn't really allow for. But you've done some interesting things. So you've got, you say you, uh, you've perfected these breakout groups um, and uh, you try to get interaction uh, happening both within the class as well as within these breakout groups. And then you've got movie nights that you host and other events so that you're really trying to get people to, even in an online environment, create a culture, mm -hmm. create interactions, create a network. Yeah. That's something mm -hmm. that a lot of schools probably haven't done. Well, a lot of schools have, maybe, maybe some haven't, but from the, the, um, networks that I participate in through accrediting bodies and so on. Uh, you know, I follow a lot of groups and forums and so on. And, and there's some good ideas out there. Some of them, which we've taken like, like movie night. I know there's some other schools doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I mean, we've got a dynamic team and, and so we've got some good ideas of our own. Um, we've been doing some thematic um, kind of webinars uh, not not for credit, not for academic credit, but just taking a theme which we think will resonate with our community. Uh, most recently, we had one on how to write a case study. And since we have a lot of students um, doing doctoral studies, publishing a case study was something a lot of people were interested in. So right. that, that worked out really well. But I think the key that you've talked about uh, that I really believe in is, is um, you know, the, the typical lecture in, uh, in uh, Psych 101 uh, was uh, one person talking to a thousand people or, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and that was sort of broadcast uh, type uh, learning. And, uh, and one of the keys of your historical success has been that it is, it is back and forth. And it's not just back and forth between the, the lecturer slash professor and the students, it's between the students. And so therefore it's like not only one way, it's two way, if not three, four or five, six way. Uh, and there's this uh, constant interaction. And I think with the, a lot of schools that went online, they started out just doing webinars. They just started doing broadcast. It was like watching a static uh, television set. Um, and okay. then they started mm -hmm. to, to find that you needed to have interaction, but the interaction was primarily just two-way between the instructor and the student asking a question. Uh, what you're talking about is through these breakout rooms, you've tried to recreate the dynamic classroom that you've got in Paris where you talk and interact and challenge the other students too. Absolutely. Um, a key factor there is class size. If you've yep. got small class sizes, then you can certainly manage and cultivate a more interactive experience. Uh, so I'm lucky from that standpoint, you know, I might have 15 people in my class. So 15, that's 10, all. Yeah. So if I have 10 or 15 people in my class, it's not, it's not so difficult to get um, some two-way communication and also to, to generate from student-student communication. You know, obviously the break room, the breakout rooms uh, kind of, 
you know, nicely imposes from student to student communication. Um, and uh, so, yeah, cl class size is, is certainly a key factor. If I, if I had 100 students that I was speaking to online, that would be very difficult. It just wouldn't work. We're chatting tonight with Matthew Andrews. Oh. He is the, currently the Director of Academic Affairs at the International School of Management in Paris, France, about, uh, about both uh, the International School of Management and their programs, but also about uh, their learnings uh, with uh, virtual um, teaching during COVID-19. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Matthew. And I'm going to ask him a little bit about his own personal background uh, and some of his research. And then I want to understand um, this idea of a part-time MBA, or even more interesting, is a part-time uh, doctorate in business, uh, either a DBA or a PhD. Didn't know it existed before. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Second and 60. We're chatting tonight with Matthew Andrews. He is the Director of Academic Activities, Academic Affairs at the International School of Management in uh, Paris, France. Um, Matthew, you said that you uh, grew up in New York uh, or in uh, the United States and that you lived in Paris now for 20 years. Is that true? That, that is true. Why, why would I lie to you, Brian? What's that like? Um, well, it's... it's I've been here most of my adult life now. My my family is here. My my wife is French. I have two kids. Um, so I've really, you know, I've made my life here. And um, I, you know, I don't regret it. There's some wonderful things about living here. There's some things that can drive you crazy too, like anywhere. Um, but yeah, I grew up, actually grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, and then I moved around a little bit in the United States and before settling in Paris. Fantastic. And how did you decide that you wanted a, a life in academia? Uh, it, it just kind of happened. I, I can't say it was a, a, something I planned as, as a young child. Um, <clears throat> I started working for the ISM at the end of the, at the end of the 1990s. Um, my current position I've been in since 2012, but, but I started working for ISM. In, in another position in, I think, 1997, 1998. And um, I got involved in kind of organizing courses, seminars outside of Paris. And it was a good fit for me because I had been living in the United States. I had been living in New York. I said I grew up in New York, but I, I, I hadn't, but I had actually been living there before Paris. Um, and what the school needed at the time was somebody to kind of go between Paris and New York and, and set up, uh, help coordinate and set up courses there. Uh, and then um, I kind of kept going with that mode and uh, the founder and the, the, the president at the time said, okay, well, you know, you did a good job in New York, why don't you go to Japan? And kind of sent me off to Japan and said, uh, um, you know, come back with an agreement. <clears throat> You know, I'll give you two weeks, but don't come back unless you have an agreement with a partner school there. So um, I did the best I could. It's not the easiest place in the world to to sort of drop in and, and, and find a partner in a short period of time. But that was in the early 2000s. And there actually was kind of an appetite in Japan to develop agreements with other schools. Um, so while it didn't quite work out the first time, uh, I made some connections there and eventually was able to develop that into a partnership. Um, later, I, I decided I wanted to finish my own degree and do some teaching for a while. So I was uh, more like a visiting faculty for several years in some French business schools and at um, a couple of the French universities, and then came back to ISM and I think it was 2011, 2012, and, and um, in my, my current job, basically since then. And you specialize in knowledge management. Is that the case? Yeah, that's the research that I've been doing. That's what I did my own dissertation in. And um, that's what I've done my recent publications in. And, and what is it about knowledge management that fascinates you? Well, when you're dealing with a, a company, I, I I've researched um, in the technology sector, and one of the main research projects I did with, was with a fairly young e-commerce company that works in the apparel sector. Um, they 
were an early mover in e-commerce and apparel companies in Paris didn't really know what they were doing in e-commerce in like 2005, 2000, well, maybe it was like 2007, 2008. So they got their activity going at that time. And when you go into a company that's dealing a lot with clients and, and services and technology, um, stated simply, it's sort of like if you have a company that has a really good recipe, you know, they're selling, <clears throat> they've got a great recipe for a cake or something. Um, and you kind of have to, 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 what's it called? Reverse engineer it to figure out what it is because uh, the knowledge and the experience has accumulated over time and the company kind of, they might think they know what they know, but in reality, they actually know a lot more than they realize. And so the research projects that I got into was trying to help the companies know what they know. Uh, so that involves talking to employees, doing a lot of group interviews, and you start with that idea, that idea of like, okay, here's this, this product that you have like to make the metaphor of the cake, you've got this nice cake, it works well, your clients like it. Now let's figure out what exactly it's made of. <clears throat> um, and so by talking to people, they, they, they sort of say, okay, well, you know, the, the company likes it because it tastes good and because it's sweet. And you say, okay, well, how do you get there? And you keep digging and digging and digging until you get something that's really kind of specific to that company and something that's grown largely from the experience of, of those employees. So it's kind of a fun puzzle to, to engage in. Um, and uh, that, that's what I find you know, fascinating in terms of, of research in, in this sector. So I find your business model as a school um, fascinating. About a decade ago or so, uh, I uh, signed up to become a student at, uh, at ISM. Uh, and I had done, uh, you may or may not know this, I had done a year of a DBA at uh, one of your competitors, and uh, and it was in the the middle America, and uh, it was a it was a, a very good program, uh, excellent uh, professors, but I found that uh, um, the program where you know you had to go every three weeks for, I think it was eight months, um, and you were taking uh, several courses uh, at a time, uh, and it stressed out over a long time, was very difficult to. Uh, to match up with a corporate life, um, a, a full-time job, because uh, if you had a deal or if you had an, you know, something that got busy at work and you missed one of those, uh, one of those weekend aways, you were dead. You were devastated. You, it, catching up uh, was a challenge. Also found that while some of the professors were excellent, some of the professors weren't excellent. And that's the typical pyramid, I think, that uh, universities, uh, business schools probably have where they hire a couple of really good top-notch brand name uh, professors uh, but then you can't afford every professor to be uh, to be the top. And then also being in uh, sort of uh, middle America, and I'm not going to mention the name of the university, but middle America um, uh, from Canada, I was the, the, the strange international student um, and everyone else was uh, sort of a domestic, um, uh, you know, middle America, uh, American. Um, you were exotic. I, think, I was very exotic of being a Canadian. <laughs> uh, let me tell you uh, at, uh, at ISM, you had a bunch of changes. Number one, uh, you came to Paris or, or to one of the other places for typically three or four days. Um, and, uh, and you took one course intensely for that three-day time period. And, um, and, and, and also, I'm not sure what your uh, current uh, policy is, but if you got busy and you had to cancel, uh, you could cancel. I, I guess you had to give some notice, but you could cancel um, and, uh, and, and, and not lose out. Uh, you obviously didn't get that credit, but you didn't lose out a lot of money and you didn't lose out on, uh, on a process. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, I think I canceled out two times or so because I just got busy and, it, and I ended up uh, being able to, to uh, come back and do it another time. And so the flexibility was helpful. Then also, because you say you've got this visiting faculty uh, model, I found that you actually were able to attract some really good faculty to come to Paris for three days to teach classes. Um, and, uh, you know, I imagine, you know, I doubt you were getting the top professors, but you were getting pretty good damn professors um, in their sectors that, uh, and I can imagine, you know, being uh, asked if you wanted to come to Paris and teach your uh, favorite topic for three days is probably something that some people really quite like the idea of. Um, and then the final thing is the student body was unbelievably diverse from around the world. And, uh, and I was more similar to the Americans in the class which were a minority. Um, and uh, the uh, unique 
people were the people from Iran and China and, uh, and Africa and, and Paris and, and other places. And I think um, Americans were still the largest plurality of most of the classes. Probably people from France were um, the second um, largest group. But um, I was amazed at some of the people from Africa that I got to meet, some of the people from Iran that would never have come to the United States uh, previously, um, and then elsewhere in the world. So I think that you were, you were more flexible, you were more diverse, and, um, and it led to a very dynamic learning environment. Have you heard that from other people? Yes, yeah, that's something that clearly, well, th those things that you mentioned together, that's what attracts most students to ISM. I also had the opportunity hmm. to, uh, to study at St. John's uh, University in uh, Manhattan and take some courses and at Fudan University in Shanghai, uh, which was really quite interesting. Took four courses and stayed for a couple of weeks uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. Um, and uh, as you say, you know, you take people from around the world and you send them to Shanghai for a couple of weeks um, and not only learning, but then, you know, staying in, in the same hotel and, uh, and dining uh, at lunch and dinner together every night and going on a little bit of excursions. Uh, including some tours that the school arranged to uh, the port and some industries and things like that, you learned a ton about the people. You got to know them better than mm -hmm. you ever would in uh, in another kind of environment. Felt sort of to me like going on su going to summer camp the way you'd uh, end up getting to know people. Okay, interesting comparison. Um, it's a it's an intense experience. Yeah, when you I've um, <clears throat> been on site for you know a few a few of our programs um in cape town in new delhi and sao paulo those are a few that come to mind so yeah it's it's quite an experience when you're there for a week or two with with uh the other students um and it, it's largely the same group but still that flexibility is there you can come and do one class you don't have to do the full two weeks you don't have to do all the classes you can go to Shanghai and just do doing business in China um, or just do Chinese economy if you want to. Um, but it usually get kind of a core group because it's a lot of time and investment if you're going to go um, to, to Shanghai. And so, yeah, the, the experience is, is, uh, is it's great. So it's, it's like summer camp. Maybe we should put that as part of our marketing program. <laughs> the thing that um, actually surprised me the most about uh, the whole idea was the idea about doing a part-time doctorate in business. Um, you know, I did my MBA, uh, you know, a long time ago, a couple of decades ago. Uh, and, uh, and it was a residential program. It was really quite a, a, an intense and wonderful experience. One of the best experiences of my life. But um, I always wanted to do a little bit more and do it a little bit more academically and theoretical, less uh, uh, just practical, and, and uh, never knew until uh, prior to uh, signing up for it that there was such a thing as a part-time doctorate. Does a part-time doctorate make sense? Well, it certainly makes sense for, for our students. Those are, those are our largest programs. Um, and yeah, a lot of people who have accomplished careers are interested in, in doctoral programs, they need something that's compatible with their professional activity. So I'd say if there's one area that we're particularly kind of specialized in and strong in, that's it. Um, and we have developed a model so that that functions and it functions quite well online, even during a period of COVID. Um, we had started doing uh, dissertation defenses um, using remote technology, which was quite an unusual thing to do for doctoral programs. Uh, a lot of people were surprised by that. But when COVID hit, you know, we I certainly think. were glad we, we had set that whole system up um, because that was the only way um, to, to continue in times of, of confinement and COVID and travel restrictions and so on. I think it's a, a really interesting idea, mainly because number one, it's it's great for the students that want to 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 do the uh, the extra learning. But I think it adds a different element to academic research uh, and writing. One of my concerns has always been that a lot of academic writing, particularly in business, was irrelevant to 
a business practitioner because it was done by academics that didn't have much real world business experience and uh, was typically written for academic journals and or for other academics. And one of the things that, uh, that I think that you really offer and other programs that are uh, part-time uh, and or executive uh, around uh, the world is that you bring in people that have got real world, real business experience. And by definition, because of that, they tend to study uh, issues that are more applicable to and relevant to the business practitioner. And so it becomes almost a, a practical academic experience rather than just a purely academic experience. Do you think that's true? Um, that's certainly key for, for our mission. Um, you know, I look at it as uh, it's kind of like studying medicine. You know, you need to have researchers who are in the laboratory doing things that maybe the public and practitioners never know about, but you also must have those, those practitioners doing, you know, clinical uh, activity, actually seeing people. And <clears throat> um, those are two crucial elements to, to medicine. And business has that dimension as well, those two dimensions. Uh, and for us, we certainly emphasize the, the, the practitioner. It's a really strong part of our, of our mission um, is that uh, the research would, would have relevance to practitioners. Um, perhaps I would say, you know, definitely more than some of the more traditional academic programs. We're chatting tonight with Matthew Andrews. He's the Director of Academic Affairs at the International School of Management, ISM, in Paris, France. We're going to take a final break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour in Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Matthew Andrews. He's the Director of Academic Affairs at, uh, at an, a university called the International School of Management, ISM, in Paris, France. Um, I'm actually a student. I've uh, uh, taken a bunch of courses and loved it. I've taken courses in uh, Paris and, uh, and Shanghai and New York. I haven't had the opportunity to go to, uh, to some of your other places, Matthew. Maybe you'll send me in the future. We'll see. Um, I have to admit, I'm struggling to finish my thesis. Uh, uh, I've got a great thesis. I've done the literature review and a bunch of research uh, questions and, uh, and interviews, but I got to get the stupid thing written and done. Um, and one of these days, but uh, life uh, just keeps on uh, keeps on uh, interfering with it all. Um, just wondering, do you have any uh, interesting stories about people and some of the interactions? Well, as you know, um, we have an unusual student body, um, and uh, so I'm always kind of fascinated by the interactions that I have with students and the things that they do. Um, Currently, uh, what, what I spent most of part of my day doing uh, was communicating with um, a student in Afghanistan, a remarkable woman who has overcome a lot of a lot of barriers. And uh, she she started doing her MBA, um, and uh, she, it was a stretch for her, but she worked hard and she has progressed and she's almost done with her MBA. Uh, but she is living in, in Afghanistan and we all know what's going on there right now. Oh my God. Um, and she had to flee where she was living and ended up going to Kabul, hope, hoping it would be better there. And now Kabul, uh, has, has, uh, been taken over by the Taliban. Now it just so happens that I was communicating with another student who is, who has a military background and who runs a consulting company in crisis management and was involved in coordinating uh, the evacuation of, of Kabul uh, with the State Department. So I put them in contact and I'm really, you know, praying that uh, there's gonna be a positive outcome for, for our MBA student, but that's kind of remarkable coincidence um, that happens. Uh, we, we get some very unusual students and, um, you know, this one student who has this activity in crisis management, that's really his special thing uh, is handling these kinds of situations. So uh, they've been on my thoughts a lot today. I can imagine. Um, yeah. Give me his name. I'd like to uh, interview him. Yeah, I will. Uh, he would be a good, a good candidate. 
Yeah, maybe we'll what about some of your hopefully. experiences in uh, in Cape Town or India? Any uh, interesting stories? Well, we hit, we had uh, an interesting time once in, in Cape Town. Um, it was a few years ago when we were running a program there with our educational partner, and the, the timing wasn't so good. It was in October, and apparently there was discussions about tuition fees going on at the time, and uh, this triggered a massive student demonstration and suddenly the university was surrounded by barricades and by uh, unhappy students. And our program was starting on a Monday morning and my colleagues were there with the Dean of the school and he said, I'm sorry, I can't guarantee your safety. Um, oh my God. We're, gonna have, we're gonna have to cancel the program. Uh, and people had, you know, they come from all over the world to these things. There's sort of like mini international conferences and you just can't cancel the program. Um, so luckily we had some very resourceful uh, colleagues. I had some very resourceful colleagues who were on site and they basically, they communicated with the faculty. Uh, there was four faculty members involved from the university and sort of said, you know, this is the situation. Would you be willing to teach the courses if we can figure out how to do it off site, off campus? Uh, so they did manage to get, a, a, I guess it was a hotel, a conference room or something like that. They got the cooperation of the teachers, in which case we, you know, we were contracting directly with those teachers and, and we, managed to run the program uh, but it was a close call and, fantastic uh, it would have been uh, you know a real shame for those students if uh, if we hadn't been able to, to to run the program matthew if people are intrigued by uh, this conversation and uh, want to check out uh, ism uh, is there a website they can go to absolutely it's uh, ism.edu so pretty easy to remember ism like international school of management dot edu um we're in paris france uh don't confuse us with the ism in germany uh i think there's another one in nigeria uh so ism paris is the one we're talking about um and you should find all the information you need there matthew andrews thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling us a little bit about uh, ism about you and about um, virtual learning during COVID 19 and the challenges of trying to get uh, interaction uh, between all the students. And I think that is one of the things that I've learned from you uh, today and, uh, and really uh, from other people uh, that I've talked to is that, uh, is that so it's not going to ever replace uh, in-person learning and the interaction that one can get in the class, but that uh, a good teacher and a good, uh, a good uh, system can get the interaction, some interaction that takes place. And it's the idea, but it can't just be one way broadcast. It can't be both ways back and forth. Uh, or it can't just be that, uh, you've really got to create this interaction with other classmates. Uh, and I think ISM has been able to do it. And uh, Matthew talked a little bit about today, how he created these uh, breakout rooms and other interactions. And, and I think that ends up being the key. And what ends up happening with that is people end up continuing the conversations uh, after the class has ended, after school is out. Uh, and uh, that's when uh, the real interaction learns. And I love that line that uh, gets uh, repeated often, which is uh, more deals get done in the coffee shops on the main floors than in the boardrooms on the top floors, because that's when people open up and really talk. And I think that's when the learning gets done is uh, in over wine in, uh, in Paris uh, or the coffee during lunch um, or other interactions that people have. So Matthew, thank you so much for joining us and telling us a little bit about uh, your educational journey and, uh, and ISM. Hey, thanks for having me. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm on every Monday through Friday at, uh, at 6 p.m. on 960 a.m. Or you can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody.